Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm Patrick, as I was saying, uh, and, and uh, this is Taylor. Taylor's going to be coming up and giving the second half of this talk. Um, we're, we're both working for a company called Morningstar that some of you may be familiar with. Um, but just as a question before, before we start, have any of you ever um, gone to a website to look up an exchange rate, like Google, where you've typed in one exchange rate for another? Yes? Have you looked up a stock on Yahoo Finance or um, on, on Microsoft? Yes? So you've used our data. Um, so, because we we are the the one of the two big data providers who who are kind of sitting behind a lot of this stuff and providing this kind of data. So for um, particularly for for, for real time foreign exchange data, uh, we we've got a lot of that business as well. Um, so yeah, we, we uh, we're going to go through in this session um, just a, a description of a particular model, a particular model that we're using in finance. Um, so this is a model which is designed to tell you what is the likely volatility on somebody's portfolio. So if somebody owns a portfolio of stocks, they own, let's say, 50 stocks or 100 stocks, there's a question of how much price movement is going to occur over the next, uh, uh, over the next three months and over the next year. And it happens that there's been a long history of building these models in finance. We're going to describe how we took a legacy version of one of these models and then turned it into a more modern architecture. Um, and what were some of the wins and what were some of the losses that we that we discovered in, in doing this? So um, what's our model? Um, I'll start, start just talking a little bit about why finance models and, and a lot of the similarity that you see here in finance models, and these models go back to about 1980, they're quite similar to some of the things that people are discovering, let's say, in the last 10 years or the last 15 years about uh, machine learning models. Uh, they tend to be very, very hard to validate. And I'm going to give you a story in, in a little while about an experience somebody had with validating them. The outputs that these models have are actually a probability distribution function. So this model is going to produce for us a probability distribution function, an estimate of the volatility of a portfolio and actually an estimate of the complete collection of higher moments of the portfolio. But then we only get to observe a very few examples of that PDF, of, of kind of samples from that PDF over time. So it's very hard to know if you've built the model correctly or if you haven't. There's an, uh, they tend to be very large. So um, our t one of our competitors, I, I happen to know, has got about 60 people working on building one of these models. Um, so they tend to have a lot of people all contributing to them at the same time. Now, the really interesting thing that happens in this industry uh, is that you have compliance issues. So if it happens that if Taylor and I were to, to put out a bad model and we were to not correctly inform some people about the fact that we put out this bad model, we ourselves personally could go to jail. We ourselves personally could be fined dollars, you know, and those sums have been historically in the millions of dollars for, for some people. Our company could be fined in the tens of millions of dollars. So we, we have a requirement to kind of get it right. And this compliance issue that we're facing in this business is, um, uh, you know, is something that's a little bit different from, from other businesses, perhaps. Um, and when you get into large models of this character, it gets even more difficult. Often you get into DevOps issues. You get into issues where you can't just rebuild a model very fast because the data no longer just fix, fits on a single desktop or a single computer. You no longer have a desktop or a laptop computer that's powerful enough to rebuild this model. So let's, I'll, I'll go through what this model um, is that we're building. Um, now, th th this is what's called a multi-factor model. And these things were first invented by a man called Bar Rosenberg. And they were invented by Bar Rosenberg in th about in the year 1980. I'm going to mention Bar Rosenberg again in a few slides. So I want you to remember that name, Bar Rosenberg. Um, and what this, what this model does, it's a linear model. So, so you have to imagine that we're in the days before machine learning, because these models were built before decision trees were really invented. They were kind of developed in the year about nine, you know, late 70s, early 80s. So it's all based on linear regression. And it's mostly still based on you know, small variants of ordinary, ordinary least squares regression. But what you do is, because they're hard to build, you do a lot, a lot of ordinary least squares regression. So we run model after model after model after model after model to, to build one of these things out. 
And what we're looking at is the, um, what we do is we take a collection of all the stocks, and let's say that we've got the stock Apple, and we can say, what's the momentum of Apple? That is, what's been the five, the 12 month previous price movement of Apple? And maybe Apple's been going up a hell of a lot. And there will be a tendency on the market for stocks which have gone up to keep going up a little bit, and a tendency for stocks that have gone down to keep going down a little bit. And what happens, uh, what happens in practice is that that tendency for stocks to go up a little bit and that tendency for other stocks to go down a little bit, we can isolate. And what we can do is just using a very simple linear regression model on a particular day, we can score every stock on how much it's gone up over the last 12 months, how much it's gone down over the last 12 months, and calculate the tendency of some underlying force of the market, some underlying momentum, to start pushing this stock around. And we can similarly do the same thing for the size of the company. So if, the si if we're looking at a kind of Apple, I don't know, $700 billion, I forget what it is today, that will have a very large size exposure. These things are called exposures in the terminology. Um, whereas a, a, a micro cap company will have a very small size exposure. And there's a tendency on market for some days, large caps go up and small caps goes down. And there's a tendency on other days for the reverse phenomenon to occur. And we can go on through, we, we've actually got 36 factors in one of our bigger models. Um, some of our competitors go up to about 100 factors. You know, the, the, these, are, these are models that have been built a lot. Um, and then based on this, we can calculate a time series of each of these coefficients. So if size keeps on giving excess returns over time, we can discover that. And then each of these factors actually gets its own volatility, its own uh, tendency to wiggle about. And we can calculate a covariance matrix, so the tendency, we can look at the tendency of these factors to co-move together and make some assumptions make some assumptions that the tendency of these factors to co-move together today is going to be similar in the future. And that's the guts of one of these models. So, so that's a, that's a three-minute introduction to a multi-factor model. Um, I, hope, I hope you caught some of that. Um, so so what, what are we doing? We, we're, we're taking the features then of all of these financial securities. We've got about 8,000 stocks, uh, better part of a million bonds in our model. Um, and we're estimating the distributions of, fact of, of the returns. Now the thing that we don't want to do, we don't want to just do this for stocks. We're interested in investors' portfolios. So we want to look at a portfolio, let's say, of 70 stocks, 80 stocks is pretty typical for, a, for an actively managed fund. Um, and furthermore, we want to regenerate, uh, we want to regenerate these historical estimates over a very, over a collection of uh, literally hundreds of thousands of funds that exist and we want to generate one of these estimates for every day in a complete history and that complete history goes back about 20 years. So we end up pushing around a reasonable quantity of, these, uh, of this data. Um, so so that's, the, that's, the, that's the guts of, uh, of what we're doing. Um, so, so what are we building at the end of it? We, we take an input, our inputs, and there's about, it's, I wouldn't call this big data, it's more medium sized data if you like. Um, but it's return data of the stocks, uh, lots of financial information, um, and then also lots and lots of information about all the managed portfolios that are out there in existence. So we've, we've got a big database of, of every, essentially most of the managed funds that exist. Um, and then what we can calculate from that is security and portfolio exposures uh, and security and portfolio forecast distributions uh, for the collection of stocks. So why, why um, so, so get, you know, the, that's, that's essentially the guts of what we're doing. Um, so we, we've built actually two of these models, and we built the first one of these models, uh, and it took a couple of years of research to build it, because they're not, they're not trivial. Um, so it was an equity only model, so it just dealt with stocks, uh, and it had about 40,000 securities. And I think this is a typical kind of architecture that you see a lot of the time, where you'll have, let's hope this works, no, nope, doesn't. Oh, does it work? Ah, no. Anyway, you'll have an on-prem, an on-premises on server, and a data warehouse. And what do I mean by data warehouse in this context? I mean just a big honking database. And so what would happen every day is that the um, application server would wake up, it would grab all the data from the on-prem database, which should have all the most recent stock prices loaded up into it. It would calculate the next iteration of the model, run this over a portfolio database, and then um, scribble everything back to this, uh, back to the relational database. 
Um, and, and it took about 10 hours to run every day. Um, and, uh, you know, it worked. It worked. But it had some real problems. And I'm, I'm going to, to kind of go into what, what some of these real problems uh, that, 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 that it has are. And I'm not going to talk about these real problems that it has actually in terms of our model. I'm going to, if you recall, I mentioned the name Bar Rosenberg, who came up with this multi-factor model uh, at, at the beginning of this talk. He's actually famous for two reasons. He's famous for two reasons. The first is he invented these multi-factor models. And the second reason is that he managed to get a record fine from the American Securities uh, Commission of two and a half million dollars. He's been banned from investing for the rest, of, from managing an investment management company for the rest of his life. Um, and he's uh, uh, there's, there's a report out on him. In, if you if you go to the SEC website, there's this report out on him, which is absolutely excoriating. Uh, and there's another report that you can find from Stanford, which um, which is one of these uh, kind of management examples of how not to manage stuff. And and, and it uses this guy who who you know to to some people he's kind of a hero, and to some people he's kind of a villain now. Um, but um, what 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 they had, and this is this the the firm he, he built. The, as I said, the first first model he sold it into a company called MSCI, uh, in uh, I think two thousand and four ish. Um, went on and built his own model um, after that. And actually, the model that he built was written in Fortran, so a lot a lot of Fortran code. And in two thousand and eight, they made the decision that they were going to port this Fortran model into Eiffel. Has anybody heard of the programming language Eiffel? Eiffel. Few people have heard of Eiffel, so they they, they thought, right, we're going to we're going to chuck this old Fortran code base. We're going to rewrite this whole thing in Eiffel, and they did. And um, in the course of that rewrite, it happened that there was a conversion from a fraction to a percentage. A conversion from a fraction to a percentage. So if you're following, you've got the number ten, and you have to divide that number by a hundred and you, to produce the number 0.1 that actually appears in the, in, in the calculation of some of this stuff. Now, somebody made a mistake. And I don't know, but I haven't quite gotten to the, ground, to the bottom of if they forgot that or if they multiplied instead of dividing. But the number was wrong. The number was wrong and it cost investors some money. Cost investors, somebody worked out something in the order of $250 million. And what happened was that um, they discovered this error in, I think, the, the, year, the, the, the month was June. And because of the architecture that they were employing to construct their model, they could not refresh the entire model for quite a while. They had a, they had a process where you couldn't just press a button and refresh the model overnight. So they were running with a dud model for something in the order of couple of months and furthermore they didn't tell investors about the fact that they were running with a dud model for a couple of months and that is why uh, Mr. Rosen and this was found out and that's why Mr. Rosenberg's investment advice uh, is no longer uh, permitted <laughs> indeed to get out to us. Um, now if you go back to our slide here that architecture that I'm describing is actually very very similar to Mr. Rosenberg's architecture and you don't want it. You don't want it because what it prevents you from doing, you're kind of rebuilding every day, one day at a time. The moment that, and it's taking you 10 hours to, to, to rebuild a single day, the moment that you're doing that, it's then going to take you something in the order of weeks. And in our particular implementation, it, uh, it was taking us in the order of two weeks um, to do a model rebuild. Um, so, um, so, so what, and what we, we, we indeed, one of these models, it's many thousands of lines of code. And what happens in practice is when you've got many thousands of lines of code, you will have bugs. When you've got many thousands of lines of code, you will have some time where you have forgotten to divide a number by a thousand. Uh, d divide a number by a hundred or multiply it instead of dividing by a hundred. So what that, and, and what that, in, just for our purposes, what it meant was that in order to fix a bug, when we found a bug, we would have to reconstruct the the model, but we also ran it so we have a separate development environment and production environment. So we'd reconstruct it in dev, and always if you do a process that's taking a couple of a couple of weeks, that process is going to fall over because there's a network error or a service falling over or a power outage or whatever. So in practice, it would take about three weeks. We'd have to do that in dev. We might find a bug. We'd probably have to redo that. We'd then do it in prod, 
and it had taken a week. So fixing trivial bugs ended up with something like a two a, a two week th uh, sorry something like a four week w um, workaround if everything was right. And in practice, it was kind of like a six week turnaround to go from here's no bug, so, sorry, here, here's the discovery of the bug, to here's the, here's the good data, which we think is, is reliable to put in front of investors. And that's just not acceptable. That's just not acceptable and also could get us in jail. Uh, so we don't want to do that. Um, so we replaced it with, then with this new ar architecture. And our, our architecture is very much based at the moment on, um, on, on the AWS. And, and so we're using um, Spark on EMR as the substantial component of it. So we've got a bunch of on-prem databases. It goes through, it goes through um, Airflow to dump all our data into S3. We then run a Spark cluster, but we've built it in such a way that we've really designed it around complete batch rebuilds for exactly this purpose, so that when we find a bug, we can fix this bug in a hurry. Um, uh, complete batch rebuilds on, on, on EMR dumps it to S3, and then we can load it into, in, into databases and expose the various bits of data through, um, through web services. And that's, that's the guts of the architecture that we've got. Um, and, and so our rebuild of the model, actually, we've, we've found, um, are these numbers right? Yeah, they, they, these numbers are right, sorry. So, so um, we, 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 the old model was, was uh, very small. Um, it took literally months to do a complete model rebuild. Um, we've now got that time down to about 10 hours to do a complete model rebuild. Uh, and the other thing that we've done is we've rebuilt the model in such a way that it's configurable, and so we're supporting now uh, something in the order of um, 10 different models, and we just control the model through a little JSON file. Um, again, a much, a much nicer way to, to, to be able to deliver these kinds of models in a hurry. So yeah, that's, um, that's the, the, the guts of, of, of what we've done, but we've have some individual lessons that we've discovered in the course of this, and, and Taylor, who's my colleague here, is going to go through some of these lessons uh, that we've uh, that we've had through doing this re-architecture. All right, thank you, Patrick. Uh, yeah, so we'll just kind of go over uh, a few of the lessons. We tried to distill it down into uh, just a couple that we thought were most important, uh, really for this project that Patrick talked about, uh, as well as some of our other uh, larger machine learning projects. So the first lesson, uh, and this directly relates to Spark or any, uh, I guess, bigger data projects um, that we've dealt with is just to get a bigger cluster. So uh, the first thing, right, so what I mean is get larger servers and more of them. Um, we run in a cloud environment, as Patrick mentioned, so this is pretty easy for us. Uh, I guess if you're running on-prem, it's a little bit harder and uh, you don't see some of the benefits. but. Um, Really, we do this because it's really easy to do, and we want to do the easiest things first. So um, we have gone through the process before of trying to um, you know, eke out all of these optimizations, um, looking at different uh, Java settings and Spark settings, um, looking at uh, different ways to do garbage collection. I spent a couple weeks kind of um, finding everything I could about uh, tuning Spark clusters, uh, and just dedicating those two weeks to it and just getting a bigger cluster uh, was way easier and, and much better. So we'll talk about some of the reasons um, why it helped us um, a little bit later, but it really allowed us to um, you know, scale up by getting twice as much uh, resources and it was way faster than two times. Uh, and even if you do do some other optimizations, uh, they can't make up for if you have a, a small cluster. So some of the reasons, uh, you know, kind of classifying the three different areas of uh, why to just get bigger servers, uh, better I.O., better caching, and better parallelization. Um, and so the first one is uh, better I.O. So the reason we're using Spark uh, is we want to keep everything in memory, so it's very fast. Um, and so if you have a too small of a cluster and it ends up writing everything to disk, you're really not getting the benefits of Spark. Uh, it's more kind of a MapReduce style where you're uh, reading everything, computing, writing to disk. So you can't really see those benefits if your, uh, uh, if your memory is, is too small. So first reason, um, you know, just uh, better IRO. You can monitor that through the Spark GUI um, by looking at um, uh, 
everything that's being spilled to disk. Uh, again, caching performance. So uh, we have a lot of data that gets reused as we're kind of um, pre-processing all of our data. And so we have the ability to cache more when we have a larger cluster. And then parallelization. So if you have your tasks, uh, if you have, let's say, 100 tasks, right, and it's running on two executors, if you get four executors, if there's no data skew, it should run twice as fast. Um, and so kind of taking all these things together, uh, we can parallelize everything more efficiently, and we're not actually writing to disk, and we can cache more. Things end up being much, much faster if we just double the size of our cluster. So what we did was really double or, or triple the size of our cluster, and then um, saw that it ran much faster, and then we kind of scaled down from there rather than incrementally scaling up or rather than um, looking at some other minor performance tweaks with the cluster we had. We found on really uh, the, the few projects we're using Spark for, scaling up first and then going back was really helpful. Uh, so the second thing which Patrick touched on, uh, I actually talked about kind of extensively, uh, building models end to end. So. What we mean, uh, as Patrick went over, is the ability to rerun models historically. So uh, that could be historically, you know, through time, but then it's also with our latest data or with the latest model, you want to be able to go from the raw data all the way to the outputted data rather than some incremental step. So I'll show this graphically uh, so we can see what I mean. Uh, but basically why we want to do this, for our case, uh, Patrick talked about some compliance reasons, um, and we really want to be able to fix bugs as quick as possible. Uh, it also lets us tweak some of these pre-processing steps uh, a little bit quicker, and we have a lot of uh, projects with some sort of time series component. And so we want to be able to say, at this time, here's what our model would have output uh, given um, this model that we want to build. Uh, and you can see this is kind of uh, inspired from something called Liebig's Law of the Minimum, uh, which is based on plant growth is governed by the least available nutrient. Uh, same thing for our models. Um, you know, we're, we're really kind of hindered by the uh, slowest thing we can uh, develop. So here might be a normal model. You can see kind of on the x-axis we have time, and in that box might be kind of a normal model that we build. So uh, you could have a model that someone else is taking the raw storage and maybe ETLing the data into some prepared data format. So uh, this will be different depending on your model. It could be you're scraping HTML documents and you're cleaning up the data and you're putting it in a database or a file store somewhere. And then your model is just taking that prepared data. Um, and so kind of in this framework, you're just building off of clean data. Uh, so part of what we mean by uh, building models end to end is really uh, going the full pipeline and taking that raw data, doing all the pre-processing or having the ability to do all that pre-processing uh, in the complete pipeline so you can build everything really quickly. And then more of uh, what we're talking about for our models and what we're trying to move for and have done for this project is the ability to recompute everything across time. So. There might be an instance in our case where uh, for raw storage, there was a correction to the data that was made. And so maybe we want to go back to that point in time and recalculate everything with that corrected data. Or we might want to have the option of going back to that point in time and rerunning a different model with the data as it was as of that time. So the ability to do both of, the, both of these things is important to us. Uh, as well as if we make changes to the model or fix bugs, uh, we want to be able to do that throughout time because this is data that we want to send uh, to our clients. So another thing uh, that we'd want to look at is tracking the accuracy over time of these models. So if you have some model that you're building uh, and it seems to have worked well with kind of the, the current data looking back, um, then it might be okay. But maybe if you further inspect that, uh, it really only worked well on kind of historical data and not well on the latest snapshot of data. So being able to track kind of the trends of the accuracy of your model builds over time uh, is, a, is a nice feature to have. 
The third thing that's been really helpful, uh, especially for this project, has been making it easy to iterate. So we've done a few things uh, to do that, but the reason why uh, we want to make it easy to iterate is because we have a team that's mixed between analysts and developers, uh, as well as financial professionals who don't really know uh, about either. So, uh, you know, we have, we, we want to get the analysts to be able to contribute as much as they can and the financial professionals be able to contribute as much as they can. Uh, and they don't want to have to worry about setting up some hard, uh, doing some hard installations or um, installing Spark or, uh, you know, creating Jupyter notebooks with a back end somewhere else or SSHing into servers or launching the model. They just want to, you know, write a function to do something. So we're trying to make it very easy for them to help. And uh, it's something that's kind of simple, but we want to, uh, we've been trying to take it really seriously. So uh, I just kind of made a, a mock-up example. So, you know, if you have basically saying, if you have one person that you dedicate to maybe making tools or making things easier for other people, kind of pays dividends later on, um, right, but maybe, maybe not right at first. Uh, so this is kind of how we view the model building process and why we want to iterate um, very quickly and make it easy for people to actually contribute. Uh, it's because these are kind of like the main areas of building a model. We uh, first might start with exploring the data and creating features uh, and then building a model and we want to test, but they're all very intertwined and we might, you know, after we create some features, we might go back to exploring the data again or some other analyst might come online and they might want to explore the data or developer might want to test the model. Uh, and so anything that helps any of these areas iterate quicker will help our, our model uh, development. So here's a few things that we tried at least. Um, creating containers and virtual machines, uh, it, it kind of worked for us. Uh, kind of not, but something we tried. Uh, Allowing everything to run locally, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, creating a bunch of data exploration tools to give to all the analysts and financial professionals, which made it a lot easier. Um, and then really just focusing on documentation and, and creating scripts that were very easy to uh, deploy things uh, was, was really helpful for us. So the fourth thing uh, is focusing on local runs. So in our cases, this has been a little bit tricky, and um, I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, we really just want to make it easy to run everything end-to-end -end locally as well. So maybe not an entire um, model build that would output full production data, but at least the ability to run through everything end-to-end. -end. And so this is another one of those things that helps us iterate very, very quickly uh, when, we're, when we're building these models. And so the challenge with that is... Uh, getting representative data samples. And so for us to build this current model, uh, you actually need some sort of uh, sample data that's represented of the population of data that you're looking at um, in order to, to test that things are working properly. Uh, and this happens in other, other uh, models that we build as well. Um, you need, you know, if it's some sort of uh, unsupervised learning algorithm, um, you know, maybe it really matters kind of the size or, or shape of your data. So uh, this is one of the things uh, that's been kind of a challenge for us um, is building these representative data samples uh, to get to the size where you can uh, actually run these models end to end. And so what our process looks like is we have kind of our application on the right side there. We have our uh, raw data right here, and then we have um, some object that abstracts this data. So, uh, you know, when we swap out this raw data, we like having that abstraction layer there. Uh, and also in that abstraction layer, we have the ability to snapshot that raw data uh, to somewhere else to be run uh, or to be used for local runs. So we've kind of built that into our data abstraction layer and it seems to have worked pretty well. And then when we start our application uh, for local runs, Patrick mentioned we use mostly config files, so uh, we can just actually, in our config files, say we want to have this uh, model run off of the trimmed data set, which is stored you know, at this location locally, and then it will run 
um, and connect to our local data connection objects, which will connect to our local data. So that's kind of it. The whole goal really for us is to, uh, or all of this is really focused around speed of iteration. So making things faster for everybody on the team, including uh, people who aren't really software developers. Uh, so anything we can do to uh, improve that speed of iteration helps us with our development practices and get our models out sooner and for our compliance issues uh, so we can fix bugs uh, and deploy models that are uh, stable and that will work for us. Uh, so, you know, we might try to think about uh, what tools can we create, what processes can we improve, uh, what headaches can we avoid, that sort of thing. So uh, now I guess we can open it up for questions. Uh, also afterwards, if anybody uh, wants to talk to Patrick and I, we're definitely around. Thank you. We've got a question over here. Thank you, Patrick and Taylor. Thank you very much. I have a quick question. So um, you work with streaming data, right? Is your data streaming or? Uh so it's mostly, um, when the data comes in, it's streaming. So there's a lot of data providers that we pull data from. Um, but a lot of, you know, kind of like financial exchange data will be streaming in. Right. Uh, our model ends up running once a day. Um, so there's kind of tricky issues because markets are open like almost all day. So we try to run it, I think, at the end of U.S. market hours to do kind of the latest day. So we take a snapshot at that time. Oh, that explains uh, why you're using Airflow. That was my next question because Airflow, by nature, even on their website, they say that, you know, this is not a streaming solution. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we snapshot Dan. Oh. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, I have a um, question for you, actually. You mentioned that uh, Docker virtual machine didn't work for you, and since we are thinking to move to Docker container for this sort of reproducibility, why didn't work? Uh? Yeah, I, Patrick might know more. Um, I, I didn't look at Docker, but someone else in our team did, but I think for... Um, for actually running Spark on Docker, they were having some problems. Um, the, the the truth is that slide's out of date. We managed to get it to go uh, about two or three weeks ago. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, since you have, I guess, your data coming in at the rate of, you know, whenever there's a trading day, but your models, however your developers can iterate them, do you store snapshots of every permutation of data and model, or do you limit this somehow? Because I guess the combinatorial complexity of this would get pretty big at some point. Do you have a way to deal with that? Yeah, so we take snapshots. Um, we do kind of, um, we take a bunch of snapshots, and then we have the ability, we store them in S3. And then we have the ability to say we want to pull data kind of as of this date. So it will basically duplicate a bunch of data into different S3 buckets. Uh, and then if we want to run it from that day, we can point our model to that date uh, based on the S3 bucket. And just for the long term, we, 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 keep month, we, we, we don't keep every snapshot. We keep more on a monthly. And we're going to get some procedure for getting rid of the older ones as well, because it, it is a bit excessive, as you say. Yeah. Oh, Patrick and Teller, thanks for the slides. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, we said that the data validation was automated. So just curious, is it just input data or the insights validation was also automated? Or if yes, then how was it? And the second thing that I had is, now that we see that uh, the models are capable of handling the previous or historical data, and there are new versions of models being coming up. so. Uh, how exactly the data lineage is being maintained in that case uh, with the various versions of models and versions of data. How did we achieve that here? So um, the, we, the output is really the focus of, of, of our validation. So there's, um, we're in a happy situation that there's been a lot of academic research done on these various factors. And so we know some things about them. 
Um, so we know that a, the, the, we know that there should be a reasonably substantial size premium. We know that there should be a somewhat smaller value growth premium. So, and, and sorry, and premium in this in, in this sense is what it means is it's the time series of the uh, coefficients that you you're discovering in these ordinary least squares. It's a term of art in in the industry, but it's it's the time series of the coefficients that you're finding in um, through this series of regressions. So you take a whole heap of identical regressions and you find this coefficient. You can then look at um, you can then look at a this time series of coefficients and you're, you, if it's the size premium, you expect that to be going up and up and up and up. So if it suddenly starts going down, that's either something's very interesting is happening on the market or your model's broken. Um, there's a, so so we, we look at that, there's um, uh, further stuff that we're doing is we have got established the, there's kind of a rolling correlation between the exposures at one point in time and the exposures as of one year ago, two years ago, and and, and a while ago. Now, the, this it, all of this stuff gets back to the use of these models because you can only actually invest in something if these premia are reasonably stable. So if it's happening that you, sorry, if you if you assign a bunch of exposures to, to the stocks today and you assign a completely different collection of exposures to those stocks tomorrow, then, and you're trying to track this in some sort of portfolio, that means that you're going to have just insane portfolio turnover. And that, and uh, so every day you're kind of rebuilding your portfolio from scratch. You, you, any return, excess return that you're getting is going to get completely destroyed by trading costs. So, so we know that there are these limits on the stability of these um, of these exposures over time if they're going to be investable. So we, 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 you know, the size, we know that the correlation of the size exposures today as a year ago should be about 0 0.96 or 0 0.97, the correlation between the values. So we, we look for that sort of thing. Yep. That's about half your question. Um, the, the other half, uh, actually, that's some, the, the truth is we struggle a, a little bit with, uh, the, with the management of, of all these large collections of data. Um, so, uh, sorry, the question was, um, how do you manage, uh, roughly I think the question is, we've got so many versions of the data, so many versions of the model, how do you manage all of these things? Um, yeah, we, we store all these models in Git, uh, we've got a very active change management process that we, we've got sitting over this thing, um, never, uh, uh, lots and lots of documentation of it, nevertheless the documentation is always getting slightly out of sync with exactly what's going on and it's, it's a struggle for us, yeah. All right, I think we're, uh, we have 30 seconds left. <laughs> uh, wow, so many. Last question, I'm sorry. After this, maybe I catch Patrick and Taylor outside. Uh, and then, of course, remember to fill out your survey as well. It's the last one. Thank you. I'll keep it simple. Um, who are the end users of this model? Is it internal use case or is it external? Uh, uh, both, to the both, people? Okay. yeah. yeah. All right, thanks. All right, thank you, Patrick and Taylor.